This Ben Jarofsky, Benny J bonus interview is brought to you in part by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers Local 126 in District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 9, the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 150, and the Chicago Federation of Labor. Benny J, take it away. Bonus time on the Ben Jarofsky Show, Tuesday, January 21st, 2020 is the date. I'm looking at the uh, old beloved bright one as I get that date. The headline, Legal Pot, BYO Beefs. So folks, think back uh, 20 years from now, if you're listening to this podcast, that was the headline in the, my beloved bright one, Legal Pot, BYO Beefs. And runaway police fire over time piling up. There's a headline that uh, always pops up uh, at least once a year. Uh, we have a bonus guest. And as always, I ask my distinguished bonus guest to introduce him or herself. Distinguished guest, introduce yourself. I am uh, Rob Martwick. I'm the new state senator of the 10th District, about six months. But uh, I spent seven years in the General Assembly as a representative in the 19th District before I got to the Senate. And... Uh, just here, having fun. All right. Correct. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert Mueller. So, and actually, uh, 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 Rob, can I have you sit in this seat here? There's something going on with absolutely. this microphone. Moving Sorry over. about Moving that. Over. By the way, are we doing this live? On <laughs> yes, the we are. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, we are live. Hey, hey everybody. everybody. Uh, my beloved right one, you can see for yourself. And the microphone's acting a little funky. Not sure why. Oh, so, right. as Rob Mark looks at Donald, just tell everybody that the way it works in the uh, state of Illinois, uh, the state rep there's two state rep districts for every one state Senate seat. So, a Senate seat uh, is a combination of two state rep seats. So let's see if you can do this for 10 trivia points. The 10th Senate District consists of the 19th Legislative District and what other district? The 20th. <laughs> God, the man knows oh, this He's stuff. good. He's good. I did not know it. It was the one, an obvious case there, Rob Mark, with me asking a question I did not know the answer to and really hoping that you knew the answer. Of course, you could be wrong, in yeah, which case we both looked at And it's, it is all numerical. Oh, duh. So, then. <laughs> so the first Senate district has the first and second house districts. The second Senate district has the third and fourth house districts and oh, so on and so forth. I should have known that. Trivia yeah. master <laughs> over here, Ben Jarofsky. So what, the 20th is represented by? Brad Stevens. Ah, that's that is, correct. That is the Republican <laughs> district. Uh, so this will lead into the first question i'm going to ask you about your re-election fight so uh, rob is from that corner of chicago the far northwest side where for years and years the democrats played footsie with the republicans uh and you never really knew the ideology of the person you were voting for it's basically a daily democrat uh daily as in richard m daily whether they were a republican or a democrat they did whatever daily said uh, you you represent uh, the uh independentization of the northwest side i just made up a word uh, in terms of uh, local politics. Yeah. And uh, as such, you have opponents who are Democrats, and uh, that would be conservative Democrats, and then you have opponents who are Republicans. So you get the be best of both worlds. No, I, I've only had opponents that are Republican. Well, no, I'm talking about in terms of people who would vote. In other words... Oh, right, uh, right, right, Yeah, yeah, and there's yeah. some of the people that are, are working against you I'm not, they're not elected officials, but they probably vote Democrat other times. They're yeah. following their orders. Or whatever. Yeah, no, the, the, the way I describe my, um, since I first ran for the House in 2012, is that I've had three primary opponents um, in the Democratic primary, all of which were Republicans. So um, <laughs> all of them, every single, uh, I, so, you know, I joke about it. Someone says, who's running against you? I said, the same candidate. That always runs against me. They said the same person. I said that's not what I said. The same candidate. So it's a Chicago police officer with an exclusively Republican voting record. Three times, um, my last opponent in 2018 was funded entirely by Dan Proft. Mm -hmm. Who hey, explain who Dan Proft is? So Dan Proft is a. Uh, 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 the a right wing uh, radio show uh, he is on one of the right wing stations in Chicago. Um, and he had a independent political pack called Liberty principles pack. And mostly what they did was they primaried elected Republicans that they didn't think were right enough. So they were sort of right of the tea party. They were backed by Richard Uline, a big business magnet who has very, very right, 
uh, views. And so they, they, they were almost the, the rights purity test. They were like, you're not right enough. We're going to primary you and take you out. Um, they went after all the people who voted for the, uh, the, the, to break the budget impasse, the Republicans who voted to break the budget impasse. But he had such particular affinity for me that he actually, the only Democratic primary he's ever played in was my opponent in 2018. Was your opponent a police officer? In 2018, he I just was. can't remember. Yeah, they, so I, every opponent I've ever had was a Chicago police officer. Chicago police officer yeah. who had previously voted as a Republican. Yes, uh, and now is running as a Democrat. Yep, and that's the same situation I've got now. Uh, my opponent has he's 45 years old. He's never, ever, not even once pulled a Democratic primary ballot um, since he's been eligible to vote. He recently pulled a Republican primary ballot and. 2016 wonder who he was voting for then um so uh <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's what i've got but they're you know they're out campaigning under the democratic banner because that's the law you're allowed to do that you can vote republican your whole life and then run as a democrat isn't there aren't there wait i'm just trying to think about it. you would know this better than i would because you know this the election code inside and out are there some stipulations uh, regarding there's stipulations regarding about circulating petitions. Yeah, you, you can't circulate for a Republican or sign for a Republican if you are a Democrat and vice versa. Um, but it's only within that same election cycle. So he could circulate for a Republican, sign for a Republican, run as a Republican in 2018, and then he can run as a Democrat in 2020. I so see. That all. It all starts. I new. get you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but of course, you know, it gets into the issue of credibility when you're out telling everybody, "Vote for me. I'm a Democrat," and you've never been a Democrat. So now, uh, your neck of the woods, as I said uh, when I first moved to Chicago, which was a long, long time ago, it was a very, it was conservative. It was mm -hmm. one of the most conservative areas in the city, the northwest side of Chicago, 41st Ward, 45th Ward. Uh, Roman Paczynski was the alderman when I first got to town. Uh, and uh, Patrick Lavar, God, I can't believe I can do this, was the 45th Ward on sad, mm -hmm. uh, the stuff that's cluttering my mind. Uh, <laughs> Dennis is shaking oh, it with a geek. Uh, and uh, so the area has become more liberal through demographic changes? I think so. I mean, I think like most of Chicago, um, the more conservative bits have, have, you know, our whole country has moved to the left. I mean, the, the idea of civil unions 20 years ago was abhorrent, and now we have marriage equality, and, and no one seems to mind. So, it you know, the, the, the whole country is, over time, that's why we're called wow. progressives, because we progress, right? Right. Let me just, t I, I, this was on the things I wanted to talk further down the list, but you, you just, our whole country has moved to the left. Well, we not Donald everyone. John Trump is the president of the United States. Not everyone, but I think that, you know, uh, certainly uh, the city of Chicago has, I mean, it, you know, you, there, there was some posts the other day about Chicago in the sixties and a lot of, a lot of Republicans who were aldermen in the, in the sixties. And, and now it, that's, you know, other it's moving. And, uh, so, I mean, there's no doubt it's a little bit, but we still have the remnants of that northwest side. Look, it's a lot of police officers, firemen, and tradesmen. It's also a lot of teachers and frontline government workers and young uh, families that move there from uh, from Lincoln Square and Logan Square and Wicker Park because they said, can't afford a million dollars for a house. Let's move to where there's good schools and there's a little backyard and nice parks. And they moved to Portage Park and Jefferson Park and Norwood Park. So, so it's, um, it is moving slightly to the left, but there's definitely remnants of the old conservative voting block there. All right, and uh, so I might as well get this out of the way before we move on to the other issues. Uh, your old state rep seat is up for grabs. Talk about who uh, you're supporting and who the candidates are and why. Well, there's there's three really, I mean, really, they're all three really good people running, and they're all really good candidates. They all bring something different to the table. Uh, the first is a, a guy by the name of Joe uh, Duplishin is his last name, Duplishin. And uh, Joe is a, a Chicago police officer and a former uh, tradesman. Um, and he gets unf unfairly painted as, oh, isn't he just another one of those Republican police officers? No, no, he's a real Democrat. He's got a really compelling story, and he's a really nice guy. Um, uh, next is Patty Vasquez, who um, uh, an old friend of mine, a former radio host at WGN, um, and she's just, you know, she's just a dynamic, magnetic, charismatic person. Uh, people who meet her love her, and she's got a lot of passion. She has a son with disabilities, and uh, uh, 
uh, medical ch- medically challenged, and, and she that really struck a lot of passion with her when Rauner went and cut that stuff, and that's what got her involved. So she's she's just wonderful. And then there's Lindsay LaPointe, who got appointed to the seat uh, when I was appointed to the Senate to fill it. And uh, Lindsay is, uh, is also just a, a fantastic person. Um, she's a social worker by trade. Um, she's got a real passion for... Um, making our system more just and more equitable and uh, standing up for people who need a voice. Really, that social work um, background has really gives her a lot of empathy and compassion for people that that need government to be there for them. But on top of that, um, she's the kind of person that, since she's been appointed to the office, it's an overwhelming place. There's a lot to learn and learning things. We were joking about earlier about pension laws. I mean, it's just, it's so voluminous all the stuff that you could read and learn and and I see her working so hard to just reach out to the community and get to know her constituents but also to sit there and do the homework and Mm -hmm. understand not oh I'm just supposed to vote yes because somebody told me to vote yes but she wants to understand why and what is this doing is how is it going to affect the future and how does it affect my constituents and and how do I communicate with them about these changes and and that's the mark of really a great legislator, someone who's willing to do that extra work, and that's why I'm I'm supporting her. She's earned it. All right. Well, uh, it seems like the, the district's lucky. They got three strong candidates, so they, they win no matter uh, who wins. Full disclosure: Patty Vasquez used to host a talk show on WGN, Ra- on WGN Radio, and I was her guest a couple of times. So thank you very much for that, Patty Vasquez. I wonder if she even remembers that she brought me on the radio and that kind of got me started. All right. Um, Let's talk about state Senate business. The papers were filled with stories this weekend about the showdown to be, replace uh, John Cullerton as president of the, the state uh, Senate. And Don Harmon of Oak Park was victorious uh, over uh, Senator Lightford, who I believe is from Maywood. So they're both That's the correct. same area. Yeah, they're uh, next door neighbors. Next door neighbors. Yeah. Um, so, all right, how did you vote in that? I voted for Harmon. All right, uh, explain why. Well, um, so I'm new to the Senate, and you know, uh, as much as I knew these people in passing, it wasn't like in the House where I worked with them and, and I really knew them. I didn't have those interpersonal relationships. I didn't know their work ethic. I didn't know what their strengths and weaknesses were. But I, d- I did know Don, and I know Don's history. And his history has been um, he is a, a, a very thoughtful and, and very successful legislator in terms of understanding policy and passing complicated bills. Um, But he's also done the work to be successful in politics. And one of the things that I always say is that you you don't, talking about policy is great, but you don't get to do the policy until you win the politics. That's essential. And the most important job of the Senate president, job number one, is to maintain the majority so that you have the gavel, you can put forth your legislative agenda and pass the bills that are important to you and your caucus members. And, and Don had the experience of, of raising a lot of money, of helping everybody. I mean, he's helped so many people in their campaigns. And while um, uh, Kim Lightford, who is, I, I, I just met her and I, I don't know her, um, she's very sincere and seemed like a really great candidate. I really enjoyed our conversations with her. Ultimately, that wasn't something that she had spent a whole lot of time focusing on. And she admitted it. She said, but I'm going to be great at it. And I say, I, but I, I don't know that. I can trust that Don's going to be great at it because he already is. And right. so, so that's, that was the, you know, I, I just, I feel, I felt most comfortable with him as president. So uh, the way it worked was, there was this cl- uh, behind closed doors debate and a vote. Am I correct on that? Yeah. So the, the, the first thing we did, so first of all, all of the, the, or the, there were three candidates, LG Sims was in it for a little while and then he dropped out. But the three candidates all reached out to all of the senators and had conversations with them individually. When we arrived in Springfield, the first thing we did was we had just two brief speeches from the two candidates, Kimberly Light Ford, not Lightfoot, Light Ford, and uh, Don Harmon. And um, we had a, a, a secret ballot vote, and that came out 22-17 in favor of Don Harmon. But of course, in order to secure the presidency, because the Republicans do get to vote on it, you need 30 members of the caucus to come together. You really need the whole caucus to come together. 22-17 is, you know, let's... How many Republicans are there in the Senate? 19. So there's 19. So is it, I mean, unless this, Harmon would win uh, unless the Republicans went for Lightford. Right. And, and it's not so much that that, I mean, it could happen. Um, it probably wouldn't happen. 
but it's more important the significance of walking out unified and everybody voting for the person who will be president mm -hmm. unified that was really important and so after that initial vote everything after that was negotiations between Harmon and Lightford as to what that unity looked like and eventually you know so our first vote was at 12 o'clock or 11 30 something like that and we walked out at 5 30 with a deal so there was a lot of back and forth in between there as to what does that mean and that's committee chairmanships and leadership positions and uh you know how is this going to work that we all come together and and uh in the end we, we they came out and lightford nominated Harmon for senate president gave him a big hug and and we voted and he was so in other words uh there was the initial vote 22 to 17. Mm -hmm. god I, just once in my life i wish i was on the other side you know what i'm saying i've always been on the outside you're outside i'm one of those reporters hanging around with it what's going on behind those doors? Yeah. so the initial vote was 22 to 17 for Harmon, but you wanted you didn't want to go uh public with that because it's a sign of division and weakness essentially yep. uh, so then uh, light forward and Harmon disappear and they c wheel and deal much like i do when i try to uh, talk guests into coming on the show the <laughs> wheeling and the dealing and <laughs> mark was like oh, i want a better time slot than that oh, okay all right uh and so uh and then my god you guys what are you guys doing while they're wheeling and dealing to you're just well, there the was a lot of <laughs> yeah. So there were a lot of members involved in this because, of course, the negotiations ultimately can affect them. Right? We're talking about leadership. So in this instance, um, some of the people who publicly supported Kim Lightford were people who held leadership positions, and the question was, well, you just lost. Do you lose your leadership position? Do you keep your leadership position? If so, how long is the deal last? Is anybody getting? You know, is anybody getting a sweetener? Is anybody getting a punishment? So there's a little bit of a, you know, and that's a normal part of politics, right? I mean, the person who comes in as president has got to be able to have people on his team be in leadership, right? You can't say, well, I'll be the president, but all of your people are leadership team, right? Um, so so there were there's those negotiations. And then, like you said, I think it's, if you read the news, if especially the Sun Times story, uh, there was some contentiousness to that, and some some public uh, airing of the grievances, as it were. Well, the one the thing I read in the Sun Times uh, had to do with uh, ancient rivalries among uh, some of the black state senators uh, over something that went down like 12 years ago, which led me to believe, wow, there's actually people in the world who will hold a grudge as long as I do. Uh, well, and, yeah, and so <laughs> Emil the, Jones. Emil Jones, right? And, and <laughs> the question is, was it or wasn't it? I don't know the, and again, that's something that, I don't know, but it, 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 it certainly will make for an interesting black caucus meeting, I would imagine, um, which I won't be in, of course, but um, you know, uh, you saw Kim Lightford come out and address the press and say that Emil Jones tanked it and they, yeah. you know, stabbed her in the back. I, no, I don't know. I have no idea if he did or he didn't. Um, but as you can imagine, one person's uh, 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 traitor is another person's hero. And so, you know, there was big discussion over what would happen to Emil. All right. So put that to the side. Think about this. Uh, say you're Don Harmon and you want to lock up your uh, 22 that you, votes for the first round, mm -hmm. you have to tell uh, various state senators, don't worry, I got you. What committee do you want? You want transportation? I got you, big guy. You want education? No problem. Now, that's one set. All of a sudden, you got to woo Lightford's voters to vote for you. Do you bump someone? Do you say, all right, Lightford voter, I'll let you put you in charge of, let's say, transportation. Then you got to call the transportation you know, Billy Bob and go, Billy, I love you, but I got to, you know, you got to make way. Did that actually happen? So that I, I cannot tell you. I mean, I think we'll see that in time. Uh, both of them uh, were very tight lipped about what they were doing. I mean, obviously, this is part of the process is, you know, people go to Springfield. It's like, you know, you know, to the squeaky wheels goes the <laughs> grease. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, people have things that they want to achieve they want to you know their their passion is in one committee like you said education or transportation they want to get there I, I honestly don't know the details of of everything that was done um for me it was easy right you know um when Harmon called me and asked me for his vote we talked about it and I, I said look I, I I wish I was I wish this was six months eight months from now I'd be in a position to say 
this, uh, you know, put me in leadership or give me a commitment. I've been in the chamber for six days. <laughs> I said, I'm not in a position to ask for anything. Yeah. And so I said, look, I, I just want to continue carrying important legislation. I want to be an opportunity to lead by example, not name. And so, you know, that, that was my ask, and I, I'm, I'm sure he'll follow through. All right, well, along those lines, <clears throat> uh, the ask for, I forget how many years you've been the chief sponsor in the House of legislation that would give Chicago an elected school board. And uh, that legislation has generally died in the Senate because John Cullerton, who was the outgoing, who's no longer the st- Senate president, uh, was carrying Rahm's water. We all know that, all right? You know, Rahm Emanuel, the old mayor, remember him? Yep. Uh, didn't want an elected school board. Johnny Cullerton used his power in the Senate to torpedo it, block it. So did you say to Harmon when he called you for support, look, young Donald, I know you were really worthless in the fight for an elected school board in the city of Chicago, but those days are past us. Uh, I need your support. Did you ask him for that? I did. I asked uh, all the candidates for it. I told them that that was my number one legislative priority, that I wanted to pass an elected school board, and that you know, uh, President Cullerton at, in, in veto gave us a commitment that it would receive a fair legislative process in the Senate. <laughs> veto. No, in, we, oh, in, the, in veto the veto se- session. Oh, I thought you meant while veto. Oh, will get you. No. Okay, yeah. During okay. the veto session, yeah. he made a commitment that it would receive, and they issued a press release that it would receive in the upcoming session, and then, of course, he announced he's retiring. So I... I I told all of the candidates that I expected them to live up to his commitment, and they all said that, that they would give it that. So what does that so, mean Is, uh, wh- well, when, when they say they're going to give there's, it? They can't, no one can guarantee that all of the senators are going to vote for it. I'll have to work on getting those votes. But given that it has passed the Senate in the past by a large number, I imagine it will pass again. So the only question is at this point is does it, does it pass as is or is it going to get amended or, you know, we'll see. Well, all right, let's talk a little bit about Cullerton's legacy. Uh, and, and this is something you know a little bit about in terms of this particular legislation. I've always argued uh, that the Cullerton was, in my humble opinion, a great joke teller, a very funny guy, very astute when it comes to politics, but a little too close to Mayor Rahm f- for the good of the people of the city of Chicago. That has always been my opinion. I'm sure John Cullerton would vigorously disagree with me on that. Mm-hmm. What's your sense of John Cullerton's legacy as a state senator? Well, I mean, it's when you look back at um, there are there are many, many, many good things that he did. Right. Um, When you are ideologues are not don't ever make great Senate presidents, because even if you are, even if you hold a, 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 a left ideology, your job as Senate president is to cater to the needs of your you know, your your caucus right Mm -hmm. and that means compromise and everyone who's in that leadership position is going to have to compromise and so by comparison to what they might have been if they were just a senator they're going to have to move more to the center and so he did do that Um, I agree with you Um, I wish he would have passed that elected school board a little while ago and there's no doubt that that's you know the reason behind it but he was someone who was very well liked because he treated people well he was outgoing he was gregarious he was fair he was honest he was accessible you could call him and he would pick up the phone he'd call you back and and have those conversations and i think that uh that's a testament to his work the with things that he talks about you know he had great legislative accomplishments but the thing that he talks about the most is you know, his first act as a Senate president was the Blagojevich trial. And, you know, I think that was, that's a that's a big responsibility to impeach a governor who had just been elected. Uh, it's easy to look back and say, well, of course, but in the time, no, it wasn't so easy. And so he, he talks about that as being part of his legacy. And then, of course, he talks about the grand bargain, which, of course, didn't pass, mm-hmm. but this idea that Republicans and Democrats could come together, Ron or torpedoed it, but that they could come together and solve the problems. And it really was sort of a, the grand bargain was a precursor to us overriding Rauner and getting a, a budget passed over his veto. All right, before we get to the grand bargain, let's take a look at Blagojevich. It's a fascinating contrast to what's going on in Washington right now. Uh, when Rod Blagojevich was impeached, and I believe the year was 20... 10 was mm-hmm. it right or is it 29 2009 29, yeah 2009 when rob Bogoyevich uh, was impeached virtually every democrat uh, voted for impeachment i think there was one or two democrats that either didn't vote or voted f- with Bogoyevich in the house i think there were one uh and uh, deb mel may have been uh who was rob Bogoyevich's uh, 
sister-in-law. Uh, I think she voted for, with Rod, or maybe she didn't vote at all, whatever. So it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Contrast that in uh, what's going on in Washington right now, almost every Republican is either openly with uh, Donald John Trump or hiding under a desk waiting for this thing to blow over. Yep. All right? There's a, like a handful who are living in swing districts. So I, in retrospect, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, I'm not so sure that, how do I put this, uh, Rob? I'm not sure it's such a, such a great virtue. It, this notion that Democrats... They out, were outraged by Rod Bogorovich's crimes and misdemeanors, and ultimately we lost as the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Republicans do whatever the boss tells them, and they win. So we may feel good about ourselves. Oh, aren't we virtuous people? We stand up to corrupt Rod Bogorovich. But Republicans could say, yeah, but we got all the power and we just go stay with our boss, even if he's an accused rapist, if he's violating the emoluments clause in the Constitution, if he's uh, arm twisting Ukrainian president uh, to dig up dirt and Joey Biden. I mean, Rob Markwick, what does virtuosity mean? To, how does that translate into something how real about, how about the republican congressional delegation sending a letter to president trump saying don't you dare pardon rod blagojevich don't you dare let him out of prison no matter how long he <laughs> stayed in there oh but but never mind those charges against the president right i mean it just it it is so hypocritical and so what i would say to you is this i hear your passion and i would love a little uh, vindictive vengeance of of my own um but I have a saying, you don't, you know what they say, how do you fight fire with fire? You don't fight fire with fire. You fight it with water. And so their hypocrisy and their, the way that they're handling this, no, we should never act like them. We should always be the high bar. We should always be the ones who take the virtuous road because the moment we devolve into that, then the whole country has gone down that path and we're the ones holding it up from that. Hold on, Rob. I gotta drink some of that Michelle Obama Kool Aid that you got. Darn straight. Mm. Ow. What does she say? <laughs> when they go low, we go high. That's right. Did a lot of good for Hillary Clinton. I I know. I know. It's, you actually believe that? I do. I really do. It's and it's it's you know like in my campaign right now. Like I said, I've got I've got people that'll take to the blogs and and just excoriate me. It's unbelievable, and I don't. I just don't engage. I just talk about the good things that I'm going to do. I don't, it just, it's not worth it. And like I said, to me, it's a matter of civic responsibility. Our civil dialogue is so low right now, and it's not good for this country. We do not need more division. And the way that you stop that is not by, not by creating more division on our own, but if, if they will try to divide then we have to try and all right divide, well no matter what it takes if you take what you're saying to the the next degree uh then you would be against the democrats impeaching donald trump no 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 that's that 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 is i, I if that's what it's not like <laughs> no uh, i i'm not saying that we should we should cater to their every woman fancy i'm i'm saying we should do our job but when it comes down to them uh playing this game of hypocrisy. I mean, the, you know, they, there's a great story uh, about um, Mitch McConnell taking the oath before God, right? These God-loving, Bible-thumping, fire-breathing, <laughs> you know, uh, Christian conservatives mm -hmm. taking an oath to be impartial when they've said, I'm not going to be impartial. Yeah. I swear to God I will. You said you weren't, but I swear to God I will. Like, what? Yeah. No, I, I think they look like clowns. And I think they are clowns. And I, I just think, once again, that we should be the dignified ones. We shouldn't put on the clown suit and try and out-clown them. Well, I just saw this uh, breaking story. Uh, in, uh, it just came over my phone. In a party-line vote, the Senate blocked Democrats' bid to subpoena documents for the impeachment trial that the White House has refused to release. So <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, it's just... That's just unbelievable. It is such an abortion of democracy that they and justice that that they can do that. And, and it's amazing that people would defend it, you know, but the same people, by, by the way, just let's go back to the impeachment of Rob Bogoyevich. What if John Cullerton as the democratic president of the Senate had had the same reaction? Yeah. 
Yeah, there was a very good chance we could think about his predecessor. We just talked about it, Emil Jones, who had a very close relationship with Rod Blagojevich. He could have done it. If Emil was there, maybe he would have. But John Collerson said, I doubt no, it. we're going to do that. I, I really doubt it. Because uh, public opinion. Public opinion. Yeah. You see, this is where we're at uh, in politics today. Rod Blagojevich was so unpopular in uh, 2009. I, I think it was in the teens of that. I just I have a vague memory of what it was. He was so unpopular. Even guys like me who should like him didn't like him. Yeah. And um, But meanwhile... Donald Trump is revered by the Republicans. Revered, idolized, yeah. feared. All yeah. three of those things together. Yeah. Yep. So Mitch McConnell is like, so what's your sense of where this is heading, this impeachment? I mean, come on. It's, it's, it, why even hold the trial? I mean, I, you do hold the trial. You go through the process because that puts them on record for what they did, and history will judge them accordingly. But, you know, we could just, I mean, if possible, let's just press the fast-forward button and get to the, you know, the exoneration of them because that's where it's added to. You know? And so what's the political fallout? You're, you've been running campaigns for a long time. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think it's mixed, right? I mean, and there's no doubt that, where Trump is popular, it's going to be, you know, this is this whole thing will benefit him, and where he's not, it will hurt him. And so I think it's mixed. I don't think it. I don't know how it affects the country. I I, I hope that some of these things make those people who voted for him that first time think twice. I mean, look, there's no doubt that there is a base of voters that never voted before in their life, and they will never miss another election because of Donald Trump. He brought people out that just were not interested in the process. And, you know, I, I actually mused before that election that if Donald Trump had lost, that we would have a four-party system. I figured, and I, and I mean that, right, because in during that last election in 2016, there were two people, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, who inspired large swaths of our country who would never participate in the process to come out. And they didn't care anything about anything to do with our process except they cared about the person they were voting for. And I really thought, okay, so Bernie loses to Hillary in a super close rate in the Democratic primary, and then Donald Trump loses because because insti you know the 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 institutional Republicans come in and go, no, I can't vote for that guy, and he loses. And I thought they split off, and now we have a four party system, but it didn't happen. Um, uh, Bernie didn't start his own party, and Donald Trump won, and so he didn't start his own party. But I think he would have. Well, it's an interesting thing. We're in the national politics, and I'm fine staying there. Uh, in some ways, your prophecy is coming true. When I look at Michael Bloomberg's campaign, now follow me on this one. Michael Bloomberg, years and years and years ago, was a Democrat. Then he became a Republican. And then he became mayor of New York City, ran as Republican. Then I think he was an quote unquote independent. Mm -hmm. And now, because he, he tested the water on a, a third party campaign, quickly came to the realization that it wasn't going to go anywhere. And now he's running as a Democrat. So effectively, he is, he represents that strain. Uh, that you were alluding to when you did your analysis of sort of the moderate Republicans. Uh, and he has nowhere to go in the Republican primary, which would have been interesting right. if Michael Bloomberg had run in the Republican primary. Just think about that. Right. Uh, instead, he's just jumping <laughs> into the middle of this leftist, the, this Democratic Party that is like moved so far left. Yep. He's apologizing for the things Rob Margaret that he used to pat himself on the back for, which right. is, you know, stop and frisk in New York and the, mm -hmm. his alleged uh, uh, praising himself for the connection of the falling of the crime rate. Uh, don't you see that? It's like, what is happening? I do. And, and you know, we there's been a lot of talk about this, how there are these many subsets within the parties and and maybe he's trying to build a coalition of course but he's you know that's the problem is that our primaries have gone so far to the right and so far to the left that there is no spot for the middle um the people that find themselves in the middle and uh we saw it with Kasich uh in the republican primary in 2016 and i think i think ultimately you will see it with uh um with bloomberg here i i don't know i mean who knows he's spending so much money it's hard to it's hard to even fathom how what what effect that will have on it because, you know, you can buy a lot of you can buy a lot of goodwill. You can buy a lot of goodwill. So um, I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting to see. But there's definitely you know we're in this weird realignment in our country, and we see it um, throughout our country, and even in the state of Illinois, where 
it, it, urban has become so Democrat and and, and and urban and suburban has become so Democrat and rural has become so Republican. And, um, you know, this realignment and you wonder how does that affect our parties? Ultimately, clearly, I mean, the Republican Party is just it's 100 percent different than it was mm-hmm. prior to, the, you know, 2015 before Trump entered the race. It was even the Tea Party was not Donald Trump. Donald Trump brought in this whole new wave. I don't even know what it is anymore. Like they, you could say that Republicans stood for certain principles. Trump's not that, mm-hmm. you know. Well, what about you? What's the impact of all this on you? Or do you feel uh, at times that you have to go too far to the left? Or do you feel there's a home for you in the Democratic Party? Uh, I do. And, and um, one of the things that I love about the Democratic Party, and I'll always defend despite the fact that there are people who would not. You know, when I first joined the legislature in 2012, there was not a lot of room to my left. Um, I remember even my father saying, when did you become such a lefty? And I'm like, I don't know, it's just who I am, you know. Um, a lot of people were surprised that my, my politics were as left as they were. And, and as I said, I think I, I don't know that you could have found, I mean, even my colleagues who might, some might think were to the left, if you look at their voting records, they were not. Um, and then over time, there have been some people, especially in the last election that came in that were, you know, socialists. So, uh, uh, to my left, without a doubt, but you know I'm still on that spectrum. But I always defend the Democratic Party as the party of the big tent. You know that we have certain core principles. We stand up for the middle and working class, but that we are, you know, I mean, we're becoming less and less tolerant to different opinions. But we always were the one that said, "All are welcome here." Where the Republicans always had the litmus test. You know, so hold up, you know, before you come in the tent, got to make sure you're okay with all of these things, and then you know. And uh, so, and I and I've always said that's why we succeeded at Illinois because we we welcomed everybody where they were a little bit more uh, rigid about who belonged to their party. So so I, I think there's always going to be a place for me in the Democratic Party, um, and uh, you know I love it. I still think we're on we're on the right path. Where you know to me the Democratic Party is is defined by the difference in our approaches to fixing our 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 fiscal problems, right? Because government is all about fiscal. Whatever social program you might love or whatever you think of education, none of it matters if your financial house is in order. And, you know, the Republicans have the trickle-down theory, like let the very wealthiest get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and then manna will rain down for the heavens and all of us little people will be fat and happy as we eat the manna from the heavens. I don't agree with that, and I think most of my colleagues believe in, you know, bottom-up, middle-out economics, and that's what we say give the people that are working a little bit of a, a extra money in their pocket and, and they'll make the rich people richer because they'll spend it. We just listen, you talk about your early days in the house, just bring back some memory. My, uh, back in those days, 2012, 2011, uh, there was a progressive caucus in the Chicago city council and they were the real, they were like the, the Ben Jarofsky types. They were. And, uh, there's like troublemakers, like six of them. I want to say five of them maybe. And when progressives in Springfield, we're going to organize. They were like, I don't know if I want to be a progressive because, like, that would get raw mad at me. <laughs> I was the founder of the Illinois Legislative Progressive Caucus, and there are people who shall remain nameless, but you could look at them up and you would go, Oh, that person and this person and that person, obvious that were back there in 2012. And they said, I don't want to be it because of the negative connotation of the Chicago. Progressive caucus. Yeah, they were afraid Rom would yell at them. That's Same thing exactly with Cullerton. Right. Yep. Most powerful center. They gotta help out Rom here. Why? Yeah, I, I Tell know. Rom to go. Yeah. That's right. That's Give exactly right. You know, I'll never forget it. I could not get anyone to join the wow. caucus. Take a show man. Yeah, sorry, Rom. Uh, no, but wow, you could not. That's. I could not get 2012. Yeah. You could not get one person? Well, I got one person. Who was the one person? Tony Berrios. Tony Berrios? Who then got defeated by a progressive? That's right. Man, get the bong out, D. This stuff is too weird to even... Be- wow. They What would they say to you? Like They said, uh, you know, I, I mean, the, it's just that... And I'm like, but you are progressive in your beliefs. And they'd be like, yeah, but... You know, the, the, the Progressive Caucus and the City Council, they're just, they're such troublemakers and there's such a negative connotation. I don't want to be associated with that. That's exactly what they said. Exactly, word for word. All of them. And like I said, you know who they are. Well, wow. you know. <laughs> all of them. Wow. And now wow. they're all progressives. Oh, I am yeah. a progressive. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's no, right. that was, uh, that's, I mean, I sh- 
could write a whole story in this one, Rob, where Illinois was in 2000. And coming out of uh, the um, Bogoyevich impeachment, uh, Pat Quinn, the governor, Pat trying to win over the Chicago Tribune's editorial board on pensions. I love Pat dearly, but right. man, they paid the, he paid a political Squeezy price Squeezy the pension python. Yeah, they squeezed him. And um, so anyway, that's ancient history. But that's, now we're at the heart of things. Because why, why so many lefties have such disdain for traditional uh, Democrats. So if I say in this show, you know, Biden's not a bad guy, all my lefty listeners will start really outraged. And I can understand completely. If you've done any investigation into Joe Biden's career, I can understand why you would say that, uh, why you would feel that way. It's the same thing when you look at the progressives, too afraid to call them progressives. So where do you think we are as a Democratic Party? Do you think we're under the sway of the ROM crowd? Or do you think we're emerging and allowing progressives not to be ashamed of and afraid of being progressives? Oh, I definitely agree that, that there is, I mean, certainly in Springfield, there is a big movement where people are, are coming together. I mean, I remember um, uh, uh, during the budget impasse, there was a, a press conference. I was asked to come to a press conference for to support a graduated income tax proposal. And I had already, I said, you know, I'd filed my own and they said, yeah, yeah, well, we're doing our own. And this was led by a grassroots collaborative, SEIU. And, and so I go to this thing and it was, it was very, very left leaning. It was, uh, it would have raised another $25 billion a year when we had a $32 billion budget at that point. So it was not, it was not a, a you know, a, a moderate proposal. And it was aptly entitled The People's Agenda. <clears throat> and I looked at it and I said, uh, you guys forgot the hammer and the sickle, you know. <laughs> oh, um, <God>. And uh, <laughs> but but my point is, is that at that press conference, yeah. there were three legislators. It was Gazzardi, Carol Ammons from Champaign, who was very, very progressive, uh -huh. socialist, liberal, whatever you want to call it, and myself. And, you know, now I, I, I mean, that was it. And, and if you'd have done that again in 2013, It'd have been me, right? Yeah. Um, and so now there are more and more and more, and now you've got the likes of Delia Ramirez and Selena Villanueva and Aaron Ortiz, and 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 the list goes on and on of, of people who are are, and even in the, in the suburbs, people who are clinging to progressive ideals. And I think that that's you know a really good thing. And like I said, you know the 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 benefit of 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 being a progressive is that eventually, mm -hmm. you know, even in the moment if we're contentious, eventually. There's a reason we call it progress is we're going to be right. We're going to be viewed favorably in history, right? Can you imagine the people that argued against marriage equality, how they're going to be viewed in 20 years, right? Yeah. And it's the, it was a very progressive idea of to, to pass marriage equality through the legislature. Not a ballot initiative, not a Supreme Court decision, but the legislature coming in and said, we, the, pe the body that's elected by the people, are going to pass yeah. this. And and so, you know, over time, we'll be viewed favorably for well, elections. Well, uh, to sort of contrary to what you're saying, one of the things that's emerged in the, in coverage, Rich Miller in particular, give a shout out to Rich, of the uh, Light Ford uh, showdown with Harmon was uh, the existence of the X caucus mm -hmm. in the state Senate and the X caucus are conservatives or what yeah, it, moderates. They're, they're, yeah, they're made up uh, largely of, um, you know, Collar County and suburban um uh, moderates, uh, they're not, they're not all white. Um, they're, they're kind of a mixed bag. Um, but there are people who would like to see things move a little bit more deliberate. And, and like I said, there has been in the last couple of years, especially in reaction to the rounder years, there has been a bit of a, um, and I'm not complaining, but you know, a, a pretty deliberate, uh, a push for progressivism. And they're like, well, let's, you know, let's uh, we would like to slow that down a little bit and be a little bit deliberate about how we move towards those things. And, uh, um, you know, I, I don't really um, uh, know. I'm so new. I can't really tell you exactly what they're you know, they don't have an agenda. They don't have a policy statement. They're not an official caucus. They're just a loose collaboration of people who feel that at times. And, and again, you know, this is interesting. So I was going to say what they, they, they feel that we should, you know, pay some heed to the concerns of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And I am i just told you that in 2012, I was maybe the most left-leaning person in the legislature. And I would tell you that I absolutely think we should always listen to what our colleagues on the other side of the aisle does. I don't think they should 
drive the legislation. They don't have the gavel. Go win some elections, then you can do that. But but you know we should always have open ears, and so you know I think they bring something to the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and but they're definitely going to play a role in the future because they were on board with. Uh, Senator Harmon's election. All right. God bless my Democrats, man. Always want to listen to the other side. They could not give me one example when a Republican has ever listened to the other side. But, oh, no, I want to listen to the other side. I hear you, Rob. Again, there's the, what's right. You know, you should listen to the other side. You should be tolerant. You should have an open mind. That's why I read the Chicago Tribune every day. Every day. Let me, maybe they're going to convince me. I'm going to read the Chicago Tribune. I'm going to open it up. Uh, not today, all right? Uh, uh, you know, they're not going to commit, but, you know, I'll, they can try, so I'm, I'm open-minded. That's right. I'm just looking for a little open-mindedness on the part of the Republicans. I, and I agree with you, and, you know, like I say, it's it would, let's not paint everything with a broad brush. Certainly, we would not have overrode the veto and stopped Rauner's just devastation upon this state and passed a budget if not for the courageous Republicans that joined us to override him. And then didn't they step down rather than run for re-election? A, a, a lot of them did because Prof said, I'm going to spend a million dollars to run you out of office, and the Republican Party of Illinois said, oh, you're on your own. Yeah. And so they said, no, nah, never mind. See, so proved my point. Right. But, well, <laughs> uh, no, you're right. It, you're right. Yeah. But, but the you know, like I said, there are, you got to keep working towards those moments. Yeah. You know? All right. Very good. Uh, we're uh, out of time. We should let you go. But before we do, just remind folks, you're running for re-election. When's the campaign? All They want to help out. They want to get involved. What are they Yeah. Doing? You know, we're, we're scrambling. Um, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Robert Martwick. And, and, Spell that. Uh, uh, last name is M A R T W I C K. That's correct, uh, <laughs> Muller. <laughs> Thank you, Muller. Uh, you know we're on all the social media, Twitter and Facebook. Look us up, send us a message. We'd love to have you. Um, we're running on the northwest side, and uh, you know we're fighting for the things that matter for working class people: fair wages, a fair tax. Of course, I was the chief sponsor of the fair tax resolution, which we have to pass in November if we're going to fix the state without crippling the middle class. And and uh, uh, champion of an elected school board running against a, a Republican trying to masquerade as a Democrat, you know, so I'm out there and, and anyone wants to come out and help out, we'd love to have you. All right. Very good. Rob Mark. Thanks so much for coming to the show. And Thanks actually, so- Ben, before we go, we have breaking news what? and we're throwing you in the hot seat Uh-oh. now, buddy. Mr. Have- Pop quiz guy. We're have- throwing the quiz to oh, you. Oh no. That's I true. I have a lifeline right here in the uh, sure, studio. Sure. Absolutely. Well, actually, if you know the answer, don't say it. I we want to see that. Ben squirm. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is breaking news from who? From who else than Frank? Frank weighed in. He's listening to the live stream right now. Frank has the uh, breaking news here. And uh, Ben, we're going to throw it to you in a second here. Now, last time Congressman Bobby Rush was asked who he's backing in the 2020 presidential race, he said Kamala Harris. But the Chicago Sun-Times just broke this story at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Ben Jarofsky. Who is Bobby Rush now backing in the POTUS race? Oh, my goodness. And you get one guess. That's it. (laughs) One guess. That's it. Uh, If I had a guess, uh, I would say uh, Congressman Rush is supporting one, Joseph Joe Biden. Martwick? I'd have to concur. I can't imagine anything else. You fellers are wrong. And this is a very surprising answer. The following comes from Lynn Sweet in the Chicago Sun-Times. Representative Bobby Rush endorses Mike Bloomberg. (laughs) Bloomberg! Oh, Bobby, you fooled me again! Says here, Democratic White House hopeful Mike Bloomberg picked up the endorsement Tuesday of Representative Bobby Rush, who was also tapped to be a national campaign co-chair. Rush told the Chicago Sun-Times that he was impressed by Bloomberg's wallet. I mean, approach... (laughs) Approach his approach to the economic discrimination in the black community. Rush, who represents the first congressional district, anchored on Chicago South Side, was a supporter of Kamala Harris before she dropped out of the race uh, in December. Frank, good one, Frank, and I hope to see you February fourth at the hideout. Uh, and wow, I'm you know what? I don't even know what to say, Does Rob. That change Martin. your mind at all? Maybe Blue, you thinking Bloomberg now? Is that helping? <laughs> no. No. Okay. Uh, Boop. I'm Bloomberg. thinking a lot of things. I'm, I'm thinking a lot of things, but I'm not thinking. Blue. Listen, I will say this, and my uh, lefty friends are going to be mad at me. I'll vote for any Democrat over Donald John Trump. Okay? Absolutely. Any, I mean, anyone who could conceivably win this uh, nomination. Uh, and so, if Bloomberg was victorious, I would support Bloomberg. Um, my great, my so. great complaint was with the Bernie voters who decided that because it wasn't their candidate, they would set it out, and the the Jill Stein people because in this this attempt for 
you know, some sort of litmus test on purity and thought and whatever. Look what they're doing to the Supreme Court. That's going to affect us for generations. All right. I uh, agree with you to a large extent. I have to agree with you with the back end of your statement. But I always point this out. Uh, Number one, Jill Stein voters, voters. I know Jill Stein voters. I know Green Party voters. They're not going to vote for the mainstream Democrat. So Democrats, you, you have to stop blaming them. They, it's about expecting a Jill Stein voter to vote for Hillary Clinton is almost as preposterous as expecting a Gary Johnson libertarian to vote. Do, do you follow what I'm, I mean, they're, yeah. just, they're way to the left of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Uh, so it's beyond, it's their, you talk about core beliefs, what, now you say you may say, "Oh, I don't." Your core beliefs are destroying our nation. You, if you want to make that argument, go ahead. But I, I've always, I've always had a reluctance, Rob, to blaming it, the yeah. far left because the they were not attracted to the mainstream. I, I know, but the, 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 you know the I always say that in the the price of democracy, the, the 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 gift of democracy is that you choose your own government. The price of democracy is that you have to suffer with your bad decisions. And the worst decision of all is not participating. And so when those Bernie voters decided to sit it out or the Stein voters chose to make a protest, fine, I'm okay with it. That, that, that You're entitled to do that. But understand the consequences of your actions. Fair you know? enough. Let me just point this out. Uh, I just I did the research on this very topic. I was taking a deep dive, and there was a study, and I wish I had it right here in front of me, that showed uh, an even a greater portion of Hillary Clinton voters in 2008 voted for John McCain than Bernie Sanders voters in 2016 voted for so absolutely uh, for Trump. Agree so, with that 100. Yes. percent and that in in you reap what you sow, right? And because that was the the Hillary Trump that that the, that Hillary group. I remember that when Barack was running and and Hillary was running in the primary, they were like, "Well, if it's not Hillary, we're not voting." Yeah. And it was like, "What?" You know. Yeah. And and look, thank God Barack got through, but but look what happened in in return now so yeah. it's you know we got to get out of that as democrats remember the big tent we got to come together hey man we got to come together so thank you yes vote for the democrat uh to quote john Lennon, come together uh so anyway rob mark we could talk politics all day we're going to cut it off there i'll let you get the last word in although there was probably something else i would come to, to counter it but <laughs> i can't even think of it at the moment uh rob mark it's a blast talking to you I appreciate Always. you coming thank in you. and that's the end of another ben Jarowski bonus show take care everybody